Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nobody, and I know nothing. This podcast today is going to be on the topic of ghosts, or spirits, or souls, or, uh, no, we won't say ghouls. I feel like ghouls are different. Are they different? Do I have one pulled up? I do not. Uh, wait, I do. Uh, ghoul. Oh, okay. Well, I guess ghoul does fit. Okay, so we'll toss in ghouls in there just for uh, just for the fun of it. But yeah, we're uh, today. I'm going to be talking about ghosts, and of course, the best place to start when talking about ghosts is what it, uh, what ghost is defined as. So I have opened here before me uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica and their tab on ghost. Let's begin, shall we? Ghost, soul or specter of a dead person, usually believed to inhabit the netherworld and to be capable, capable of returning in some form to the world of the living. According to descriptions or depictions provided by believers, a ghost may appear as a living being or as a nebulous likeness of the deceased or occasionally in other forms. Nebulous likeness. So I found the use of nebulous kind of fun there because nebulous is a fun word. So I pulled open because they had it highlighted so I could pull it open and they took me to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And what does Merriam-Webster Dictionary tell me the definition of nebulous is? Of relating to or resembling a nebula. Indistinct, indistinct or vague. So uh, they break it down a little bit further and they say that uh, the from, it comes from the... Uh, Latin nebula, meaning mist or cloud. So, the mist people. The people of the clouds. Resuming. Belief in ghosts is based on the ancient notion that a human spirit is separable from the body and may maintain its existence after the body's death. You are more than just your physical form. In many societies, funeral rites are believed to prevent the ghost from haunting the living. <laughs> I wonder if that's why people had, um, like, funeral pyres uh, as a way of, uh, <laughs> it's like, no, 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 see, see, like, what, it doesn't matter what happened to you, see, there's nothing, nothing to be mad about, see, you don't got no body no more, and to make sure you can't do weird things with your body no more, we got rid of it, we didn't just bury it, we, we really, really got rid of it. So, like, no no haunt me. No haunt me, Val Spirits. You can't do so. I threw you six feet in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Resuming. A place that is haunted is thought to be associated by the haunting spirit with some strong emotion of the past. For example, remorse, fear, or the terror of a violent death. Individuals who are haunted are believed to be responsible for or associated with the ghost's unhappy past experience. Yes, because the easy explanation for someone saying that my house is haunted is, oh, you murdered them? Or you had them killed? Like, <laughs> let's just, I mean, why would you, why is that your first go-to? It's like, yes, clearly this ghost, because you lack a conscience, the ghost has come back to give you one. And by give you one, I mean night terrors. Like, five plus Benadryl level night terrors. Like, shadow demons hitting the gritty in your corner. Uh, compare with possession. Possession. Uh, so, I have that pulled up as well. And possession is defined as by the Britannica Encyclopedia. Or, sorry, Encyclopedia Britannica. In religious and folk traditions, char condition characterized by unusual behavior and a personality change that is interpreted as evidence that the person is under the direct control of an external supernatural power. Symptoms of spirit possession include violent, unusual movements, shrieking, groaning, and uttering disconnected or strange speech, like reverse Latin. 
Occasionally, a normally pious member of a religious body becomes incapable of prayer, utters blasphemies, or exhibits terror or hatred of sacred persons or objects. Christianity and some other religions allow for the possibility that some of these states have an evil transcendental cause, which would see the need for exorcisms. Most scientific studies treat them as psycho psychophysical manifestations to be dealt with medically or in terms of social, social psychology. Some conditions historically termed demonic possession have come to be treated as epilepsy, hysteria, somnambulism, schizophrenia, or other organic or psychological forms of illness. In some traditions, the, quote, possessed, unquote, individual becomes ill and is regarded by his community as having committed some spiritual transgression. Again, back to the, you're, ha you're, you're possessed, therefore you did something evil. Not a good, personally, not, not a great thing to assume. Recovery is held to require expiation of his sin, often by a sacrifice. How funny if it was human sacrifice. You're possessed because you killed someone, and the only way to get rid of the possession is to sacrifice another person for you. <laughs> In other traditions, the possessed person is conceived as a medium for the controlling spirit and functions as an intermediary between spirits and men. Not women. Women aren't part of this. Don't bring women into this. This is a man problem, and only men can solve this problem. His major role is usually to diagnose and heal other spirit-afflicted individuals. In this tradition, the trance behavior of the medium is often self-induced, auto-hypnotic. It may be stimulated by drugs, drugs, drumming, or collective hysteria. In his trance, the medium appears genuinely insensible to, uh, to ordinary stimuli. That's, yeah, that's possession. But what if, roll with me on this, what if possession was more literal? Like your possessions, like I have this um, double-walled uh, vacuum-sealed thermos that I like to put uh, cider in, or like my speakers, or this microphone I'm talking into, or my computer, my possessions. My, I have possession. So what if, what if it's not spirits from the other world, but it's the spirit of communism? I'm not haunted because, you know, I murdered a person. No, 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 no. It's much deeper than this, friends. No, see, the reason why I'm being haunted is I have things and... These these spirits, they do not. They they lack, and they say, "Who who is this bourgeois prick that we the proletariats we must be made to have without?" I say, we torment, torment the bourgeois for the rights and the good of the proletariat masses. All shall be equal, and once all is equal. No one will be. <laughs> All right, resuming. The traditional visual manifestations of haunting include ghostly apparitions, the displacement of objects, and why? Why is it whenever, um, whenever like books are flying off the shelves, like, oh no, it's a poltergeist. Oh no, your house is haunted. It's like, what if? What if it's not a ghost? Like, what if I'm telekinetic? You don't know that. Why is it the ghost? Why, why, what's saying the ghost can do this? Why can't I be doing this? You can't deny me my telekinesis. I am superpowered. <laughs> Sorry. Resuming. Or the appearance of strange lights. I think drugs can help with that. Auditory signs include disembodied laughter. Yes. As they always say, the, the sound of children laughing is wonderful. Unless you're home alone. And it's terrifying. And screams. Yes, screams. Because, you know, those don't just randomly appear out of nowhere sometimes. Footsteps. Houses move. Ringing bells. Wind exists. 
I am being a little facetious with all these. And the spontaneous emanation of sounds from musical instruments. <gasps> Are you telling me that my banjo doesn't just play itself? Did I buy a haunted banjo instead of an electronic banjo that plays itself? Are you telling me the soul of Billy Bojob uh, Bondaloo isn't playing this banjo in the corner right here? I know I said I'd learn it, but who needs to learn it when it plays itself? Yes, I'll just keep having Billy Bob play it. I was lied to. That man sold me a haunted banjo. What? What a jerk. Tales of specific ghosts are still common in living folklore worldwide. The telling of elaborate grisly ghost stories, often in a setting enhanced by darkness or, thunder, or a thunderstorm, is a popular pastime in many groups, particularly among children. So, that's another weird thing. I don't know of any real ghost stories that happen during the daytime. It, it feels like more often than not, anytime you hear about a ghost story... It's always d dark at night. Like, where are the ghost stories um, that happen during the day? Let's see if we can find some. Uh, ghost stories where the spirit appears during the day. Let's see. No, I don't want to watch a YouTube video on this. 12 ghost stories that send shivers down your spine. Japan's three great ghost stories. Well, maybe they have something. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Nihon Sandai Kaidan. Na, 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 na. Apparition of a young woman. Uh, wearing a white kimono. No feet. No feet. It's all you people out there who like feet. No horny for you. Let's see. Archetypical images. Uh, da, 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 da. Onryo. Oh, it's a type of vengeful. It's a type of spirit. They're vengeful spirits. Uh, almost always women who died experience betrayal, rage, hate, or jealousy and has returned to exact revenge. Let's see. Mention of Onryo in Japan would immediately bring to mind Otsuyu, Okiku, and Oiwa, traditional tales that would make up the Nihon Sandai Kaidan, Japan's three great ghost stories. Da -da -da -da. Uh, walking a dark road, has to be at night. And that one's for Otsuya. Let's see, Okiku. Let's see, Okiku. Na -na -na -na. Let's see. Samurai tried to court a young servant. Let's see. Da 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 da. Uh, he he tricked her into becoming his mistress because if she didn't, she would have been killed. Do 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 do. Oh, beaten and thrown into a well. Oh. I think I know this one. Let's see. You can hear her counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And when no tenth plate is found, she'll let out a blood curdling scream. It is said that even today, those who hear her counting might fall very ill. And those who make hear her make it all the way to nine will die soon. Oh goodness. Well, it doesn't say when it happens. So I guess you could say that one could happen during the day. So we have one possible option. Oiwa. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's a weird image. Um, but clearly based on the image, that's a nighttime thing too. Ghosts don't, don't like the sun. We'll just go with that. When, you're, when your entire being is only noticed when it's dark enough that you appear to be of like light... You cannot be seen in light. Let's go with that. And I mentioned earlier, ghoul. Uh, 
sure, just don't give me full access to the article. Thanks. I think this little part it gives me, though, uh, it's an Arabic term. Ghoul. In popular legend, a demonic being believed to inhabit burial grounds and other deserted places. In ancient Arabic folklore, ghouls belonged to a diabolical class of jinn and were said to be the offspring of Iblis, the prince of darkness in Islam. They were capable of constantly changing form, but their presence was always recognizable by their unalterable sign, uh, the donkey hooves. Considered female by the ancients, the ghoul was often confused with Sila, also female. The Sila, however, was a witch-like species of jinn, immutable in shape. So, a ghoul could look like a Sila? Whatever. Okay, I don't think ghouls quite fit in, so we'll pretend I didn't read that. So, let's do some more reading on ghosts. Uh, here I have an article... Written in 2019, oh, updated in 2019, but it was originally posted on the History Channel's website, history.com, uh, late October 2009. Since ancient times, ghost stories, tales of spirits who return from the dead to haunt the places they left behind, have prominently in the folklore, have figured prominently, prominently in the folklore of many cultures around the world. A rich subset of these tales involve historical figures ranging from queens and politicians to writers and gangsters, many of whom died early, violent, or mysterious deaths. What is a ghost? The concept of a ghost, also known as a specter, is based on the ancient idea that a person's spirit exists separately from his or her body, and may continue to exist after that person dies. Because of this idea, many societies began to use funeral rites, rituals, as a way of ensuring that the dead person's spirit would not return to, quote, haunt the living. Do, do, do. Huh, that's funny. A little side note from History Channel. Did you know the notorious mobster Al Capone has reportedly appeared to disrespectful disrespectful visitors at his funeral plot in an Illinois cemetery. Spectral banjo music has supposedly been heard coming from inside Capone's old cell at Alcatraz, where he was one of the first inmates. So Capone played the banjo. My brain doesn't want to put those two things together for some reason. But we'll, we'll, uh, but that's the clear implication here. Al Capone played the banjo. Neat. Places that are haunted are usually believed to be associated with some occurrence or emotion in the ghost's past. They are often a former home or the place where he or she died. Aside from actual ghostly apparitions, traditional signs of haunting range from strange noises, lights, odors, or breezes, to the displacement of objects, bells that ring spontaneously, or musical instruments that seem to play on their own. Early Ghost Sightings In the first century AD, the great Roman author and statesman Pliny, Pliny, P-L-I-N-Y, we'll go Pliny, Pliny the Younger recorded one of the first notable ghost stories in his letters which became famous for their vivid account of life during the heyday of the Roman Empire. Pliny reported that the specter of an old man with a long beard rattling chains was haunting his house in Athens. The Greek writer Lucian and Pliny's fellow Roman Plautus also wrote memorable ghost stories. Centuries later, in 856 AD, the poltergeist, a ghost that causes physical disturbances such as loud noises or objects falling or being thrown around, was reported at a farmhouse in Germany. The poltergeist tormented the family living there by throwing stones and starting fires, among other things. Three Famous Historical Ghosts One of the most frequently reported ghost sightings in England dates back to the 16th century. Anne Boleyn the second wife of King Henry VIII and mother of Queen Elizabeth I was executed at the Tower of London in May 
1536, after being accused of witchcraft, treason, incest, and adultery. Really? Really, really, British royalty. Incest, you had to toss... Really? All right. Sightings of Boulain's ghost had been reported at the tower as well as in various other locations, including her childhood home. He... Haver? Hever? H-E-V-E-R. He, he, Hever? I'm going to call it Hever. Hever Castle in Kent. America's own rich tradition of historical ghosts begins with one of its most illustrious founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. Beginning in the late 19th century, Franklin's ghost was seen near the library of the American Philosophical Society in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Some reports held that the statue of Franklin in front of the society comes to life and dances in the streets. Sounds like, sounds like something that you'd see happen at, in Night at the Museum. Strange. Though many ghost sightings have been reported at the White House in Washington, D.C. over the years, perhaps no political figure has made so frequent an appearance in the afterlife, at, afterlife as Abraham Lincoln, the nation's 16th president, who was killed by an assassin's bullet in April of 1865. Lincoln, formerly a lawyer and congressman from Illinois, is said to have seen is said to have been seen wandering near the old Springfield Capitol building, as well as his nearby law offices. At the White House, everyone from first ladies to queens to prime ministers have reported seeing the ghost or feeling the presence of Honest Abe, particularly during the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt? Roosevelt? I should probably learn how to say his name right. I say Franklin D. Roosevelt, but I might... I should probably say Roosevelt. Another president who guided the country through a time of great upheaval and war. Haunted places. Some locations simply seem to lend themselves to hauntings, perhaps due to the dramatic or grisly events that occurred there in the past. Over the centuries, sightings of spectral armies have been reported on famous battlefields around the world, including important battle sites from the English Civil War in the 17th century, the bloody Civil War battlefield of Gettysburg, and the World War I sites of G Gallipoli? G Why do I have to be introduced to so many... Let's see, did I spell that right? Ga G A L L I P O L I. Pronunciation Gallipoli. Gallipoli. Okay. I'm going back. Resuming a seed, the of Gettysburg in the World War I sites of Gallipoli, near Turkey, and the Somme, northern France. Another particularly active center for paranormal activity is the HMS Queen Mary, a cruise ship built in 1936 for the Cunard White Star Line. After serving in the British Royal Army, or sorry, in the British Royal Navy in World War II, <laughs> The 81,000-ton ship retired in Long Beach, California in 1967. The plan was to turn it into a floating luxury hotel and resort. Since then, the Queen Mary has become notorious for its spectral presences, with more than 50 ghosts reported over the years. The ship's last chief engineer, John Smith... Really? Legit. John Smith. All right reported hearing unexplained sounds and voices from the area near the ship's bow. In almost the same location as a doomed British aircraft cruiser, the Karakoa, or the Karakow, had pierced a hole when it sank after an accidental wartime crash that killed more than 300 sailors aboard. Smith also claimed to have encountered the ghost of Winston Churchill, or at least his spectral cigar smoke, um, in the Prime Minister's old stateroom aboard the ship. 
Many visitors to the Queen Mary have reported seeing a phantom crew member in blue overalls working the decks. Around the ship's swimming pool, reports have been made of mysterious splashes and ghostly women in old-fashioned bathing suits or dresses, along with trails of wet footsteps appearing after the pool had been drained. Hmm, that's more interesting. Among major cities, New York is especially rich in ghost stories. The spirit of Peter Stuyvesant, the city's last Dutch colonial governor, has been seen stomping around the East Village on his wooden leg since shortly after his death in 1672. The author Mark Twain is believed to haunt the stairwell of his one-time village apartment building, while the ghost of poet Dylan Thomas is said to sometimes occupy his usual corner at the West, Villager, West Village's White Horse Tavern, where he drank a fatal 18 shots of scotch in 1953. Okay, well there you go, friends. That's the limit for scotch. 17 shots. Hit 18, you're dead. At 17, you're good. I wonder if you can still die at 17 and a half, though. Perhaps the most famous New York ghost is that of Aaron Burr, who served as vice president under Thomas Jefferson, but is best known for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel in 1804. Burr's ghost is said to roam the streets of his old neighborhood, also the West Village, Burr's spectral activity is focused primarily on one restaurant, one if by land, two if by sea, which is located in a Barrow Street building that was once Burr's carriage house. Well, that's, that's sort of interesting. Let's see. And then I also pulled out this article written by the BBC, Why We Should Believe in Ghosts. This was also written late October 2018. I Do ghost articles, like articles about ghosts and spirits only pop up around Halloween? Like, really? That's the only time where, like, that's the only time people care to hear about ghosts? It's Halloween. It's boring. All right, well, let's jump right in then. Telling tales of ghouls and specters can have a surprising benefit by encouraging people to change the way they behave. Halloween is a time when ghosts and spooky decorations are on public display, reminding us of the realm of the dead. But could they also be instructing us in important lessons on how to lead moral lives? The origins of modern-day Halloween date back to Sam Hain, a Celtic celebration for the beginning of the dark half of the year. When, it was widely believed, the realm between the living and the dead overlapped and ghosts could be commonly encountered. Again, we're back on the tr we're back on the whole you you don't see ghosts during the day, you only see them during the night. So it'd make more sense that after the winter solstice, daytime is shorter and nighttime is significantly longer, you would see more ghosts. So at least that's you know Overlapping details, that makes sense. Puzzle pieces that fit together. Woo! In 601 AD, to help drive, to help his drive to convert Northern Europe to Christianity, Pope Gregory I directed missionaries not to stop pagan celebrations, but rather to Christianize them. Accordingly, over time, the celebrations of Sam Hain, Sam Hain, sorry, Sam Hain, not Sam Hyde, sorry. I mean, we can always just blame Sam Hyde for this, but Sam Hain. The celebrations of Sam Hain became All Souls Day and All Saints Day, when speaking with the dead was considered religiously appropriate. All Saints Day uh, was also known as All Hallows Day, and the night before it became All Hallows Evening, or Halloween. Not only did the pagan beliefs around spirits of the dead continue, but they also became part of many early church practices. Lucrative belief. Pope Gregory I himself suggested that people seeing ghosts should say masses for them. The dead, in his view, might require help from the living to make their journey towards heaven. Is this what started purgatory? Maybe. During the Middle Ages, beliefs about souls trapped in purgatory... Oh, well, maybe I should just read the article, guys. During the Middle Ages, beliefs 
about souls trapped in purgatory led to the church's increasing practice of selling indulgences, payments to the churches to reduce penalties for sins. Because, you know, that's... <laughs> that makes sense. The widespread belief in ghosts turned into the sale of indulgences into lucrative practice within the church. It was beliefs that contributed... It was such beliefs that contributed to the Reformation, the division of Christianity into Protestantism and Catholicism, led by German theologian Martin Luther. Indeed, Luther's 95 Theses, nailed to the All Saints Church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, I'm not reading that the British way, was, was largely a protest against the selling of indulgences. Which makes sense. How is giving money to men... Supposed to save the souls that you believe are in purgatory. It makes zero sense. Subsequently, ghosts became identified with Catholic superstitions in Protestant countries. Debates, however, continued about the existence of ghosts, and people increasingly turned to, increasingly turned to science to deal with the issue. By the 19th century, spiritualism, a new movement which claimed the dead could converse with the living, was fast becoming mainstream and featured popular techniques such as seances, the Ouija board, spirit photography, and the like. All right, so let's take a little dip off to the side. So some fun fact about the Ouija board, spelled O-U-I-J-A. So naturally it makes sense to say we, O-U-I. Uh, but I'm not sure why it's not a Ouija board. Why is it Ouija? Like, who decided J-A made a G-E-E -E sound? Like, G Willikers, Batman! Like, no, it's J-A. If anything, it's Yah. It's the Wea board. <laughs> uh, but, um, just for reference, the Ouija board is called the Ouija board because the guy, the guy who made it as a way to act as a medium to connect people with spirits asked what the board was called because he didn't have a name for it and they say that the that the little eyepiece thing spelled out Ouija and that's why it's called a Ouija board all right resuming the article although spiritualism faded in cultural importance after world war one many of its approaches can be seen in ghost hunters of today who often seek to prove the existence of ghosts using scientific techniques. Here's a little side note. In Taiwan, for example, about 90% of people report seeing ghosts. These beliefs are not just part of the Christian world. Most, although not all, societies have a concept of, quote, ghosts. In Taiwan, for example, about 90% of people report seeing ghosts. Along with many Asian countries such as Japan, Korea, China, in Vietnam, Taiwan celebrates a ghost month, which includes a central ghost day. When ghosts are believed to freely roam the world of the living. These festivals and beliefs are often tied to the Buddhist story of the Uraban Sutra, where Buddha instructs a young priest on how to help his mother whom he sees suffering as a, quote, hungry ghost. Um, I did read that, the Uraban Sutra. Um, uh, hungry ghost means he, he saw his mother as a spirit, and she was so incredibly hungry, and he gave her rice, and as soon as she grabbed the rice, it turned to dust, or uh, when she went to like eat it, it turned to dust before she could, so uh, she couldn't eat no matter what it was. So, uh, I don't quite remember what the moral of that uh, particular sutra was but that's what a hung but that's what the hungry ghost is the ghost is the spirit that's desperate for f uh, food or sustenance and uh, no matter what they get they can't eat it so as in many traditions Taiwanese ghosts are seen as either friendly or unfriendly the friendly ghosts are commonly ancestral or familial and are welcomed into the home during the ghost festival. The unfriendly ghosts are those that are angry or, quote, hungry, 
and haunt the living. Moral Reminder As a mythology scholar at the University of Southern California who has studied and taught ghost stories for many years, I have found that ghosts generally, quote, haunt for good reasons. These could range from unsolved murders, lack of proper funerals, forced suicides, preventable tragedies, and other ethical failures. Ghosts in this light are often seeking justice from beyond the grave. They could make such demands from individuals or from societies as a whole. For example, in the U.S., sightings have been reported of African-American slaves and murdered Native Americans. Scholar Elizabeth Tucker from Bingham State University of New York details many of these reported sightings on university campuses often tied to sordid aspects of the campus's past. Sounds like mass hallucination, but sure. In this way, ghosts reveal the shadow side of ethics. Their sightings are often a reminder that ethics and morality transcend our lives and that ethical lapses can carry a heavy spiritual burden. Yet ghost stories are also helpful. In suggesting a life after death, they offer a chance to be in contact with those who have passed and therefore a chance for redemption, a way to atone for past wrongs. This Halloween, along with the shrieks and shtick, you may want to take a few minutes to appreciate the role of ghosts in our haunted past and how they guide us to moral and guide us to lead moral and ethical lives. Right. So, now that we talked about that, let's talk about the science. I'll just read this one. I'll just drop the second article I had pulled up. Uh, it wasn't. I just sort of skimmed it, but re-skimming over it, I didn't find the information I was hoping it would have. In pulling up a secondary article... Also didn't have the information I wanted, so. So I've got this article by Science and Media Museum, a uh, uh, UK organization. The article was published uh, February 14th of 2022, titled, Using Science to Investigate the Paranormal. All right, let's begin. Science has long been used to investigate seemingly supernatural phenomena. Read about some of the most famous examples and what they tell us about the historical relationship between science and the occult. From Harry Price and his, quote, National Laboratory of Psychical Research, end quote, to the infamous case of the Cottingley Fairies, this story looks at the scientific instruments, methods, and technologies used to test or debunk Spiritualist mediums, fairy apparitions, and ghostly visions. Harry Price and the National Laboratory of Psychical Research In the years after 1900, several psychical laboratories were, were, were purpose-built in Britain, Europe, and the U.S. by serious practitioners aiming to establish rigorous, rigorous controlled conditions for scientifically investigating the supernatural. Psychical investigator Harry Price established the London National Laboratory of Psychical Research, NLPR, in 1926. Price defined psychical research as an attempt to ascertain by exact experimental methods how far the alleged phenomena of the seance room can be brought into line with normality. Could science explain the strange phenomena spiritualists and occultists claim were stemming from an unseen world? To conduct these, quote, exact experiments, Price's laboratory was equipped with a range of technologies, from cameras to dictaphones, voice recorders, and barographs, instruments, that register, instruments for registering changes in atmospheric pressure. These were used to measure conditions in the seance room, document what was recurring, and study the medium's body and associated phenomena. Price designed several special apparatuses for psychical testing, but simple instruments like thermometers were often the most useful tools for collecting evidence. In Price's 1923 testing of the medium called Stella C, the room's temperature was carefully monitored. It registered significant drops in temperature during performance, from 15.5 degrees Celsius to 9.4 degrees Celsius in the first sitting. Great. Now I gotta convert that to freedom units. Alright, I need centigrade. 
to Fahrenheit. Thank you, Google. All right. So the room started out at 15.5 degrees centigrade, which is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and dropped to 9.4 degrees centigrade, which is 49 degrees Fahrenheit. So it dropped 11 degrees from 60 degrees to 49 degrees Fahrenheit in the first sitting. The spiritualist periodical Light excitedly explained that this was the first conclusive empirical proof of the, quote, cold breeze spiritualists believed accompanied spirit phenomena. The testing of Mina Marjorie Crandon. Boston-based medium Mina Crandon, alias Marjorie, was a famous subject of scientific scrutiny in the 1920s. Marjorie was known for producing, quote, ectoplasm phenomena. Sounds like an innuendo, but strange bodily emanations she claimed were of spiritual origin in seances. In the 1920s, Marjorie was investigated by several psychologists, physicians, engineers, and others using a range of scientific instruments and approaches. Flash photography was important for visually capturing hard-to-see phenomena in the dim, red-lit seance room. Many photographs were produced for stereographic viewing. This process made objects and photographs appear three-dimensional, which investigators argued enabled more accurate observations of the phenomena. Investigators treated the seance room like a field laboratory, subjecting Marjorie to strict controls, including physical restraints, to establish test conditions. Her ectoplasm, often taking the form of a crude hand, was a particular focus, especially since its authenticity was backed up by Marjorie's husband, a Harvard-trained surgeon whose medical background lent scientific credence to her performances. Definitely look up the spirit hand of Marjorie. Or, uh, what did they say her name was? Mina Crandon. Uh, uh, M-I-N-A-C-R-A-N-D-O-N. Look her up and look up that hand. It's a deformed glove that looks like it's seen better days and maybe caught fire a couple times. The hand supposedly belonged to the spirit Walter. Skeptical, skeptical investigators speculated that the hand was stored in Marjorie's vagina, but this was never proved. Well, you'd have to do some question, morally questionable things to prove that. Marjorie was internally searched before and after seances. But because of her social standing and marriage to a well-to-do physician, many investigators treated her more respectfully and with greater benefit of the doubt than they did working-class mediums. In some seances, Marjorie allowed impressions of Walter's ectoplasmic hand to be taken in softened dental wax. The weird glove hand... She's... Okay, so she's wearing, like, a bathrobe looking type thing and she has this gloved hand extending out of her groin area questionable investigators compared these fingerprints against those of prior seance attendees some alleged that walter's fingerprints matched those of her still living dentist who had participated in an earlier seance but not all agreed with this charge nor that it suggested fraud a note in the scientific journal Nature documented the controversy, including countercharges by other investigators alleging bad faith, falsification of material evidence, and sinister motives, including that the wax print had been tampered with. They have a side-by-side -side image of the glove and the dentist, which I'm going to go ahead and call not the same. Because I can very... So... The reason why I'm saying this is at the center where all the ripples come to a single point and there's a single arch and then lines inside the arch, the dentist's fingerprint inside of the single arch has three lines coming up into it, whereas the gloved hand... Oh, wait. Or does it? No, it does. It's a little hard to make out, but... No, there's some slight discrepancies. I mean, it might be the same, but I'm not, I'm not convinced by that. But I'm also not that good at looking at old fingerprints... I mean, like, yeah, no, I totally see exactly what this is. No, I am not good enough for that. 
This kind of debate surrounding proof, trustworthiness, and evidence is common in the history of psychical investigation, showing that establishing empir empirical proof or disproof of psychical phenomena was never as straightforward as it seemed. Marjorie was debunked by some, but not all, investigators and continued to perform l into the late 1930s. Here's an example of not testing the supernatural. The Cottingley Fairies. Causes in which individuals producing supernatural phenomena were not subject to... Su Sorry, cases in which individuals producing supernatural phenomena were not subject to such scrutiny by investigators are equally important for understanding the relationship between science and the occult. The Cottingley Fairies case remains one of the most renowned supernatural episodes in Britain. In 1917, cousins Francis Griffiths, at the time eight, and Elsie Wright, age 15, borrowed the family's mid... Midge? I wonder if it's Midge. Uh, they borrowed the family's Midge camera to photograph fairies in their garden. The situation would escalate when word about the photographs reached celebrity author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the trained physician and rationalist creator of Sherlock Holmes, who was also renowned as a leading spiritualist supporter and often participated in spirit investigation. Doyle brought the girls to expense bought, sorry, Doyle bought the girls two expensive cameo cameras and plates to produce additional photographic evidence of fairies. Doyle published several sensational pieces asserting the photograph's authenticity, including a sellout book in 1922. The fallout damaged both, the fallout damaged both his reputation and the lives of the young girls who were bullied, hounded by the press, lost jobs, and were forced to move. In 1983, Elsie wrote a letter explaining the case from her perspective to make clear what had seemed obvious to many readers for decades, that the fairies were faked, a practical joke that got out of hand. Some see the case as representing a triumph of hoaxers over gullible dupes, but the truth is more complex. Unlike his other supernatural investigations, which relied on physically examining the mediums and apparatuses, Doyle in his inquiry made no attempt to meet the girls. The reason for Doyle's reluctance to investigate in person remained up for debate. Did he believe the girls of their age and class were not skilled enough to produce such photos? Or were other factors at play? Either way, the Cottingley case is an interesting exception to the trend of hands-on and physical investigation. Well, there you have it, friends. Ghosts. Some history on them. Some stories about them some science behind them. So, I will leave you to make up your own mind. May you become a hunter, may you become a denier, may you become a believer. That is it for me. And as always, have fun, stay safe, and don't talk to bears.